We're very excited to have you here with us this morning to welcome Marion Bogo. Marion is an internationally recognized researcher and scholar in field education. Um, and she's here with us this morning to talk about her work in competency-based field education. Um, Marion is also the North American editor of the International Journal of Social Work Education. Um, and she's a member of the faculty at the University of Toronto. So welcome, Marion. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And it's a pleasure to be back in Buffalo when we were doing the clinical supervision conference here for about five years. I looked forward every June to my drive down through from Toronto down to Buffalo and to meeting with many of the social workers and faculty members, not only from your university, but from all over. And we've moved the conference now to uh, Long Island, and I, I kind of feel sad about it because it's a different group, and it doesn't have quite the same flavor and oomph that it used to have here in Buffalo. So I was very pleased when uh, Laura and Zoe came up to Toronto and we started some discussions um, about field education. And what I'm going to try and do this morning is summarize and present in about an hour plus some of the essential features of field education and social work. What the research has led us to conclude is effective, dynamic, and appears to work. Then I want to make sure that you all have the opportunity around a break to talk in small groups, probably where you're sitting with each other, and to talk about what are the challenges that you experience in offering the kinds of field education practices that appear to be effective. And for those of you who are students, what are the challenges that you face as well in the field? And then we'll finish the morning off with some general discussion about what came up in, in the small group discussion looking specifically at what are creative ways of addressing the challenges that everybody, that everybody faces. So that's essentially the overview of what we're going to be doing. I do want to begin, though, by saying that the knowledge base about field education has grown substantially over the last half century largely fueled by the work of people in North America. There have been a number of social work educators and their colleagues, social workers, in agencies offering field education who've done a lot of studies and have really contributed to quite a vibrant literature. And so I think North American, US and Canadian um, folks should take credit for this contribution. However, we have not yet been able to develop studies that really link field education to client outcome. So we still have a big way to go in terms of developing the evidence base. But it also would not be correct to say we don't really know what we're doing. I think we definitely do know what we're doing, and we do have really an accumulated body of study, study after study, finding very similar things. So I first want to begin with a very complicated diagram. I don't know how well you can see these overheads. However, you do have the handouts. Um, the point of the diagram is that when you're talking about field education, you're talking about what I used to call when I ran our field program, um, casts of thousands. Because you have a university with a university social work program. And that social work program in some way 
has to relate not only to the local and regional context, but also to the expectations of the national accrediting body. You have agencies, and I imagine many of you are from social work agencies. Your agencies are funded, often through some federal or state or, or local program, or they may be a private agency. Your funding reflects a mandate, an expectation about what your agency is supposed to do and achieve in delivering service. Then you have a community, and I must say this is not the most elegant diagram, so there should be all kinds of arrows showing how everything's interrelated. You have a local community, you have community groups, you have stakeholders, all of whom have an opinion about what social workers should do and how social workers should contribute to the well-being of your community. In some jurisdictions, community members are far more involved in social work education. For instance, in the United Kingdom, what they call service users or consumers or what we often call clients are often involved in social work education and even involved in evaluating students' learning in the field. In North America, and actually in most countries, we haven't gone in that direction, but we are definitely very sensitive to community impact and community needs. Um, then if we come more closely to the field program, we have the field office with the field liaison. In the agency, you are the individual field instructor, but you're always relating to your own team, to your colleagues, to other staff members. And so the focus on the student, the field liaison, the staff, the agency climate, and of course the field instructor. So when we think about field education, let's not forget this larger context. We tend so much to focus just on the student field instructor relationship, and I'll be talking a lot about that, but we are operating with a cast of thousands, with lots of different people with different opinions that affect what we can and what we can't do in field. So the traditional components of field education have been these three. That field educators are, field instructors are educators. And more and more we're using the terms interchangeably. I've tried for very long to get people to stop calling it st uh, student supervision. I've been totally unsuccessful. People like to call it supervision. But really supervision came out of the model of the agency overseeing the practice of the worker to ensure that the worker was delivering effective service. Field education is about educating a student. A staff member is paid to do a job a student pays the university to educate them. And the university contracts with the field to provide education in the field for the student. So it really is a different paradigm. Now, there is an aspect of supervision in that all of the student learning takes place in the agency while the student is learning how to deliver a service. So again, as a field instructor, you've got two roles here. You have the educator role with your responsibility to the school, because in fact, you do operate as a gatekeeper. And I'll come back to that. Um, but you're uh, you're working with the student in the setting with real clients and in the last analysis, you, the field instructor, are responsible to the agency for the service to that client. So in that respect, you're also a supervisor. I think these different roles create certain kinds of tensions 
which probably will come out through the morning. Tensions that I think social workers are very good at managing. But I think it's useful to highlight that there are tensions in the role. The other um, very important um, role that you play is as a gatekeeper. We've been talking more and more, especially here in the US with the new educational policy focus on competency, we're talking much more about identifying what do social work students have to be able to do when they graduate, how do we assess it, and in that way, how do we keep the gate as to who enters the profession? Unlike a lot of our um, colleague professionals, especially in the health field, we don't have real licensing exams in many jurisdictions in, around the world. And if we do have exams, they're often written exams. And as field instructors, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that there is a big gap between what we're able to say we know about practice, what we're able to write about practice, and what we're actually able to do in practice. So even where there are licensing exams, they, in my opinion, they aren't really the best measure of competence. And if you look again at colleagues in health professions from physiotherapy, occupational therapy, nursing, medicine, all the specialties, they have to demonstrate their ability to do in order to be licensed. So I think this remains a challenge for us in social work. And so a burden to some extent falls on the field instructor because you are likely the only people who are close enough to the student's practice to really be able to assess their competence and determine that they are ready to graduate, graduate or to go on in the program. Um, you may have, how many of you, ha of you have heard the term signature pedagogy? Just, just the people connected to the university, okay. Well, I won't go into this in great depth, other than to say there's been a recognition on a national level that field education is where it all comes together. The knowledge, the values, the attitudes, the practice. Field education is where we really socialize students to think like a social worker, we have a way of thinking. To act like a social worker, we have a way of interacting, we have a set of skills. And to be like a social worker, we have a set of values that are integrated and enacted in our practice. So I now want to talk about <coughs> the principles of field education. And I'd like to just make the diff uh, note the difference between the content of field education, what you teach, and the process of field education, how you teach. So just for a moment, and I'm not going to ask you to share this, just think for a moment of the content, three things that for you are your key curriculum in field education. By that I mean you may be in a child protection setting and you may feel every student that I work with must learn how to engage with high risk families where they can balance control, <coughs> the mandate, ensuring safety, and empathy, collaboration, empowerment. That may be kind of your content. You may be working in mental health where your key idea is, I'm working with people who have chronic 
um, mental, me uh, psychiatric conditions, and there is a person in that condition, and I am working, and I want to teach students about empowerment and about recovery. So I think it's important to, for field instructors to identify what are the key content pieces for you? The school will give you lots of expectations, but the expectations from any school about what students need to learn to do are articulated at a level that will fit any setting. Each of you have your own content, your own curriculum based on your agency and based on what you believe to be important. So I urge you all, and as I say, I'm not going to go into the content dim dimension because I'm sure it will be very diverse, but I urge you all to identify what are some of the key content pieces that you teach. <clears throat> what I am going to focus on is the process of field education. And um, before I go into it, I want to talk about competence. And again, this is another one of those overly complicated diagrams. And there should be, and there sometimes are, lots of arrows going between the various boxes and pieces. But uh, the last time I presented it, someone said to me, the arrows are too distracting. So I took all the arrows off, and I'm not sure if it captures that this should be seen as a very integrated, interrelated set of components that go into competence. I've talked about the organizational context, that any competent practice takes place within a particular organization. And at the bottom, the professional context that regardless of organization, we are always teaching and hoping to socialize our students into a particular value base of social work. But the essence of competence is this middle, <coughs> this centerpiece, complex practice behaviors. Really, you think about your own practice. When you look at your own practice, you see all kinds of actions that you're taking. If I were to watch you working with an individual, a group, a community, a committee, what have you, I would see all kinds of very complex behaviors. Those behaviors reflect what you have integrated from the knowledge base, for instance. So you have generic knowledge, you have specialist knowledge, you have theoretical knowledge, and I expect you have knowledge about what works. What works and also knowledge about why is the problem the problem that it is. So that knowledge <coughs> is in you. You've integrated it, you've constructed it, you've made it your own more or less. And in some way, it would be evident in competent practice. As well, there would be your judgment. A lot goes on inside of us <coughs> as we think about what we know and the situations that we're interacting with. How do we make decisions? What are our assumptions? How are we thinking about what we're seeing and what we're experiencing? How are we evaluating it? And all of that is highly connected to ourselves, our own subjective experiences, our own subjective reactions to what we're involved with. So the way in which the knowledge base gets transformed into practice is very much through our own selves, through how calm we are or how worked up we are. And all of this internal, all of these internal dynamics <coughs> will get articulated 
through the use of skills. Open-ended questions, close-ended questions, seeking concreteness, probing. But if we were to only look at the skills, if we were to think that competence and skills are equivalent, we would really miss, to me, the, the real meaning of competence. The real meaning to me of competence is that it's this very difficult, nuanced, and organic putting together of these various dimensions. So why am I presenting this? I'm presenting it because when you are doing field instruction or you are a student learning, these are the various domains that need to be touched upon. Now, one could never touch upon all of these domains as you reflect on or deconstruct any particular practice situation. But overall, within the, supervi the field instruction session, within a couple of weeks, within a month, overall as a field instructor, you want to be sure that you are touching on all of these domains if you are trying to educate for competence, which is what we're trying to do. I think this also shows why um, teaching in the field is so difficult. Because when you teach in a classroom, you're often focusing on knowledge and how students think about it, evaluate it. Or if you're teaching in a skills lab, you're focusing on the skills and probably some on the student's internal self. But when you're talking about integrated practice with real people in the field, you're talking about um, a view of practice that, that is really very complex. So the question now is, if we, with that background, if we get to the process of field education, we really want to think about how do students learn? How does anybody learn? And what do field instructors do to facilitate that learning? And then what students can do to promote their own learning? Now, if you think about your knowledge base, and just for a moment, those of you who are field instructors, think about your own experiences probably as a student, certainly as a staff member, your own experiences that led you to say, when I offer field instruction, this is what I need to offer. For those of you who are students, certainly your current <coughs> experience as a student in field is building your principles for when you will be a field instructor. There's also theory, which I'll try and touch on in an integrated way, and research about what works in field. So again, my suggestion, and we don't have time for it today, is to try to get at what are some of your own key educational beliefs and practice? What is your practice wisdom? What is your model of field education that you try to offer as you work with students in the field? Now, here's my summary slide. There have been a lot of studies, and interestingly, what we find across all the studies is moderately high to very high satisfaction on the part of students with their field experience. So the chances are that the field education we're offering is generally getting it right for most students. The key uh, principles, and I'll go into them all in more detail, I've summarized on this slide. 
the socio-emotional context, the ability to observe and debrief, reflective discussions to link all of these many domains that I was talking about, and the opportunity for students to be observed and to receive feedback. So the first thing I want to talk about is the relationship. Because we see this again and again in all of the studies of social work students. Interestingly, um, there's a developing literature on clinical education in the health professions. And uh, what's coming out of um, that body of studies is a lot of support for what we've been doing, either intuitively or because it's part of being a social worker, what we've been doing for decades and decades. So this idea of a certain kind of relationship is one that appears pervasive. And I think theoretically, it makes sense in terms of adult learning theory, the idea that when we come to a learning experience, especially learning a profession, where what we're doing is such a part of who we are, that we bring ourselves to that experience with our own feelings our feelings about ourself. And as we start receiving feedback, and as we start receiving input from clients, from staff members, from the field instructor, we, we can experience that as a blow to our self-image, as a blow to our self-esteem. And generally, what the theoretical literature says, and we all know this, those of us who do clinical practice, that when we're experiencing input that's unsettling, having the context of a positive, supportive relationship becomes the holding environment, the place in which one can relax enough, calm down enough to hear, to process, and to integrate that information. So, a kind of the model, as I, as I talk to people in other professions, the model of the harsh, critical um, senior doctor with the young medical student being critical, that model is really being rejected. And our model of a more gentle, supportive, empowering, collaborative relationship is, is being seen as very useful. Um, Certainly, all the neuroscience research is showing that learning is optimized when we're relaxed, when um, we're not feeling stressed, when we're not in kind of a high anxiety state, um, and that positive emotions really aid our thinking and our remembering. So I think it's useful to remember that learners are often in a state of feeling some degree of anxiety. And when we feel that anxiety, there's many normal, typical, hardwired possible reactions. One, we, one reaction is to flee, so to avoid seeing clients to be very guarded in the field instruction meeting, um, to miss it occasionally. Another uh, way of responding to anxiety is fight, so that we get involved in unproductive arguments and exchanges. Another reaction to a lot of anxiety is to freeze, where a student is in a situation where they really feel flooded to, to the point where they feel they can't do anything, or to actually fragment, to, f to just lose a sense of self and of integration. There's been a lot of studies about what students are anxious about as they go into the field. 
And generally, the studies have shown that students are very concerned about whether they have enough ability to do anything helpful, to offer anything of use to the clients, the groups, the communities that they work with. Students are also often, in these studies, report being uh, anxious about diversity. How will they deal with someone with a life experience so different from their own? How will they deal with diversity around their age, their young clients or older? How will they deal with ethnic diversity, with gender diversity, sexual orientation, race, religion? So there's a lot of issues that students are anxious about that depending on the student, <coughs> depending on the stage of development, if they're if you're uh, in a BSW program with very young students, if you're in a master's program with somewhat older students or with students who are returning to school, the anxiety will be very different based on their stage <coughs> and based on <coughs> based on how much practice experience students have to draw on. We've been doing a lot, <coughs> a lot of research um, <coughs> in Toronto using simulated clients and then debriefing with students. And what we find is that when students are in um, situations that are completely new, for instance, um, some students would say, I've never interviewed an older woman who's in a grief situation because she's just lost someone. I didn't know what to do. I became so anxious, I just didn't know what to do. Other students will say, same thing, I've never, I, I never interviewed a client like this before, but then I remembered, and they'll draw on a personal experience, losing a grandmother, losing an older aunt, and I remember how the family reacted. And so students, depending again on their life experience, on their stage of development, will begin by drawing on these personal experiences to help them manage their anxiety and to help them interact in the present with clients. So what we as field instructors then need to do is provide support and provide a relationship that is the context for learning, but also to recognize that optimum anxiety really fuels learning. It's very interesting that in all of our social work literature, we talk about anxiety and about how to lessen anxiety. And yet, in the educational literature, the, the uh, people who developed the signature pedagogy concept that it's, it's in field that you really learn how to be a social worker, they recognize that optimal anxiety fuels learning. And so I think we should be talking, when we think about relationship, about balancing high support and that it comes naturally to social work, uh, social workers, but also high expectations and high challenge. That it's okay to be anxious insofar as it fuels your learning, and we need to keep the anxiety at a level that it doesn't flood you and really um, leave you unable to learn. So again, what are the principles what are the, that come out of the research literature? And when we get to the point where we talk about challenges, I hope you'll have a chance to really talk about this. So here are the four ingredients that seem to be related to this perception of a high quality relationship. First of all, that the field instructor is available, 
that they're interested. Well, I expect everybody in the room is interested or you wouldn't be here. But very often we hear stories of people who were forced by their agency to take a student. And the student very quickly feels that their field instructor is not interested, doesn't really want to be doing this, it's a burden. And of course students pick this up. So available, interested, and supportive. Meetings that are regular, that are frequent, once a week is usually what we expect, and that are of some duration. I think usually we ask they be an hour, an hour and a half, but certainly there are situations where meetings get canceled, they don't get rescheduled, and this really leads students to feel out there on a limb. A balance between structure and autonomy. Again, depending on the stage of development of the student, at the beginning, usually people need and appreciate a fair amount of structure. But as the field experience continues, as students begin to grow and develop, they really want and need more and more autonomy. And a balance between emotional support and feedback. Feedback that is constructive. Very often the feedback is so positive and there may be something a little bit negative sandwiched in there and then there's more positive that students will say I didn't really get what the issue was. So I think from the research and just from what we know about learning, feedback does need to be both positive and critical in a constructive way. And I'll be talking more about feedback. Uh, we, at one point in Toronto, we were doing a lot of training on helping students to give feedback to field instructors to let the field instructors know um, what is helpful to promote their own learning. And students would say to us in these workshops, but you're forgetting about the power dynamics. And so we started then developing a workshop called the Power Paradigm. And field instructors generally do not feel that they have a whole lot of power. And yet, because of your role, because of the assessment component of it, you do have power. And so the issue becomes balancing and managing the tension on the one hand between the power you have to pass or fail, the power you have to transmit knowledge, to give access to cases, and the ability to be supportive and to work collaboratively with students. I think field instructors can do this because as social workers, so often, especially if you're working in mandatory settings, child protection, for instance, this is your work. It's always balancing collaboration and the fact that you have some degree of control or authority. Um, since this is the land of Larry Shulman, I just put uh, some of Larry's points down on, the, on this uh, overhead because I think he does it very well, talking about contracting and clarifying, reaching for feedback, discussing mutual obligations. I kind of feel I don't have to go into this in too much detail, but um, I think Larry's great contribution uh, amongst many is the idea that we can negotiate these things, we can talk them out, we can put it on the table. So the context of the relationship is crucial. I just want to briefly tell you about a study we did where we were looking at, we interviewed a bunch of students in southern Ontario schools and asked them to tell us about traumatic experiences they had had in the field. And we thought a lot of these experiences would be related to clients. We actually did have one student who had a client who committed suicide during the practicum. 
But a lot of the traumatic experiences we heard were about things that were going on in the agency where they would see other social workers behaving with clients or with each other in a way that was very disillusioning, really not uh, respectful in a professional way. We had one young woman who was really struggling with competence issues and, um, and uh, was doing a group program and it was around Christmas time and they were lighting candles and her hair caught on fire. Now her hair quickly was put out, but it was a very traumatic experience for her. But what came out of the research, and it was very interesting, and we had a good number of participants, was as bad as the situation was, whether the student experienced it as a trauma that they could not get over, or whether they experienced it as something they could move along with, totally depended on the relationship with the field instructor. How the field instructor was available, helped process it, helped the student go through it. And these were all situations that were deeply upsetting to the students, as seeing um, staff members really behaving in a cruel, inappropriate way to each other was very, very upsetting to a student. And yet, the way the field instructor helped manage it in that relationship, helped the student to deal with it and understand it, made the difference. So there is no question that the relationship is the crucial factor in this. But it's not, as in work with clients, the relationship is crucial, but not the whole story. So here are the other key components that I have tried to extract from the literature. And there are, I, I lay them out in a cycle, but they don't go in a neat way from one to two to three or four. Uh, but just so that it, you, know, you could see it, I put it in this way. The first thing is the issue of practice. Probably everybody who's ever taken a, a new field instructor training course knows about Kolb's experiential learning model, which really talks about how do we learn from experience. And so concrete experience is the key piece, theoretically, in his model. But again, the contributions from neuroscience really show us that for the brain to be able to integrate new knowledge, we need action. We need actions again and again and again that make sense to us, that are relevant. That's why field learning, it's so much fun to be teaching in the field because students are so motivated to learn because they have to see the client a few hours later. So you rarely will find a student sitting and yawning when they're in the field because the drive to be effective and helpful really gets you your juices going and you're so open to learning. But the learner has to construct the knowledge for themselves. The, the learner really has to work with the knowledge. And as a result, again from neuroscience, we need many opportunities to practice. Um, we've also seen from some of Ricky Fortune's studies, and Ricky is in Albany, so sort of a New York neighbor. She's done a lot of wonderful studies on field. And from her studies, more practice, students who had more cases, more interviews, more groups where they were leading them had higher self-evaluation of the skills, higher overall evaluation of their whole field performance, greater satisfaction, and higher ratings of their <laughs> performance by their field instructors. So I don't know if any of you have read Malcolm Gladwell's books, but in one of his books, 
he took some very heavy duty um, uh, research from a, a cognitive psychologist, Erickson, who had studied how do people develop expertise. And the cognitive psychologist had studied um, virtuoso violinists and athletes and, I, and I, one other profession. And what they discovered was that if you look at people at a certain level, so people who are all pretty good, the difference between the pretty good and the really expert <coughs> was practice, practice, practice. And they came up with, or maybe Malcolm Gladwell came up with, I'm not sure who did, the 10,000 hour rule that you need 10,000 hours of practice to assimilate what you need to learn. So these are, we're talking about complex practices here, which if you recall my competency slide, that's what we do. We do complex practice. 10,000 hours to assimilate all of this new knowledge and be able to carry it out in actual work with clients to gain mastery. And then um, Levitin, who is a neuroscience a scientist, has actually, in a more serious way, demonstrated uh, the same kind of need for practice and practice and practice. It actually made sense to me. I sat down and I figured it out. And the 10,000 hours came to, for me, about 10 years of practice. And then I remember it as a young social worker, how it took so many years until I kind of felt I knew what I was doing more or less. So the question then is, do our students practice enough? Because I often see our students in the field sitting in meetings and listening to other people and on the phone, and I'm not sure entirely what they are all doing. But then I look at nursing students. I spend a lot of time in a, um, uh, a health professions research, education research unit, and I look at the nursing students who are running around and they're taking blood again and again and again and they're giving needles again and again and again. And I look at the medical students and they're listening to chess again and again and again. And I just wonder if our social work students are having the opportunity to practice again and again and again. And uh, this has implications for what we do in the schools if we have um, skill labs, if we have opportunities for students to practice, but it's certainly to practice the skills, but it certainly has implications for the field. And the takeaway is, are your students having enough chance to actually practice? Then we come, now practice on its own, as any of you who've tried to learn a sport know, doesn't necessarily make you good. Uh, um, I mean, I can practice hitting tennis balls and not get any better unless I have some good constructive feedback. I'll come to that later. But you need the practice in order to at least learn. Observation is the next point. Our earliest model of field education was an apprenticeship model, where in the early days of the, in the early 1900s, uh, social work students simply followed experienced social work practitioners to learn by observing what they were doing. Theoretically, we know that social learn from social learning theory that we learn a lot by watching and modeling after experienced practitioners. And there's been some very interesting research, um, and in the interest of time, I, I'll just mention it briefly. It's about the idea that 
there's a know-how, how to manage things that is often not written, that comes from being in the organization, situated in the actual practice experience. So those of you, again, who work in agencies, there's a know-how that an experienced practitioner may not even be able to tell you, but can show you. This research came from watching um, shoemakers in Africa and how new apprentices begin to learn the trade and the craft by being in the community of practice. So how do we observe student practice and students observe practice? One of the ways is by co-working, sharing assignments. Another is being observed behind a mirror or with selected segments of audio or video. And um, it's interesting, one of the signature pedagogies in psychology is that students' work is videotaped and reviewed with their, their supervisors. In social work, we've done that and we've not done that. The, often when I'm in agencies, the one-way mirrors are there, but the rooms are used as storage rooms. People are not using the one-way mirrors the way they did in the heyday of family therapy. When they do, um, I'm on sabbatical this year, so I made it a point of going and observing some people doing live supervision, just to remind myself of how powerful and how effective it is. Uh, audio and videotaping is the easiest thing to do nowadays with our smartphones, with easily accessible cheap equipment, and yet, of course with consents, but that goes without saying, and yet are we using that kind of uh, taping, the student analyzes it, and the student then brings to the field instructor selected segments of where you're stuck and where you think you did well. Um, so what's the discourse? The discourse is that, oh, it will make people too anxious. But uh, some researchers in psychology, again at Albany, have showed that if you induct students into, this is the way we do field instruction. They do it with psychology supervision. This is how we do it. We watch you behind one-way mirrors, we do videotapes, we analyze the videotapes. There is no anxiety. The anxiety goes down. So the question, and again, I don't know, maybe this is how you're doing it here in Buffalo, but in most places, in North America, we're not using this wonderful technology. We're not observing. And we're creating a very private practice rather than exposing our practice to the input of our field instructor and of our fellow students. So much learning can be gained through peer input, but peer input of what actually happened. Because how can you really have a reflective discussion about um, topics about things that you haven't seen? So very often our dominant mode of operating is talking about what happened and then reflecting on it, or writing a process record and reflecting on it. But again, neuroscience research shows that us that we distort. And we all know this as individuals in our lives, not only as clinical practitioners, we distort what, happen, what happens. So then I sometimes get really concerned and wonder if all of our field education is resting on constructions of what happened rather than on what happened. So as we move to competence, 
which really is looking at these complex practice behaviors, then we really do need to see what actually happened as the student was interacting with the client, the group, and so forth. Also, how can you possibly give feedback on skills if you haven't seen what happened? Um, a fellow at Yale, Steve Martino, um, ha is, if any of you work in the alcohol and addiction field, you would know his name. You know, the federal government here has given millions and millions of dollars to developing all these evidence-based alcohol treatment approaches. But then when they move them into the agencies, they don't work. They don't get these wonderful outcomes. So they then started putting a lot of money into looking at implementation science, transfer, whatever you want to call it, to try to find out what's going on here. So Martino did this work in agencies. If you ever have a chance to see this guy or read his stuff, it's terrific. And he said the research almost killed him because he was all over the place. He was in homeless shelters. He was in small community agencies. He was in the places where treatment really happens, not in the clinics where the models were developed. And he recorded all of the um, interviews and then analyzed them. And what he found out was that there is a lot of chat that goes on in the treatment sessions. Now, yeah, you can say, well, that's in the interest of developing the relationship. But he found that that was more than that. What he found was that practitioners speak with clients about topics that are not related to the issues under attention, and practitioners make self-disclosures also that are unrelated to the issues that were being discussed. So what, in fact, they were chatting about was common experiences, like if they'd seen the recent baseball game or football game or what have you, the opinions, opinion, political opinions, that opinions that really had no relationship to the client's therapy issues, a lot of current events. Now, of course, there's a lot of interesting current events in your country right now, especially with the, uh, deb the uh, well, the debates are sort of over, but even we in Canada were watching those, uh, those Republican candidate debates. What was that? The ball blues. And the studies found that the practitioners initiated this chat. So um, I rest my case. I think we do need to try. Now, again, I want you to talk about the challenges to offering this kind of stuff. Um, you're going to try and, OK, good. Um, Um, the, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the challenges about this, but the issue really is, are there samples of observation for teaching? You know, it, are there samples, God, I did get, a, I got a little discombobulated, okay. Are there samples where you have observed the student's work that you can use for teaching? and, very importantly, for assessing competence. Did this study make any conclusions about the chat? Um, oh, yeah. His conclusions were that you needed supervision and live supervision. That the reason the models were not working was because they weren't being used in the way they were supposed to be used. Instead, so yeah, they, situation, no people chatting. don't chat. But you get people out into the field, and they are drifting off the models. Um, they're not. Um, they're not staying true to the approach. Instead, they're chatting. Yeah. The next thing on the. Oh well, good. You have the hand handout. The next thing is the reflective discussion, and this is what we do very well in social work. I think. 
Um, we do spend a lot of time talking with students about um, what they see, what they make of what they see. Donald Shun, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with his work, but it, he really was the leader in talking about a reflective practicum. And again, it links to this idea of signature pedagogy. When we reflect with students on events, on experiences, we're really teaching them to think like a social worker because we're sharing our reflections. We're sharing the lens, the ideas, the values through which we understand the practice. And the hard thing about that is that you do you, as you're talking, what's coming out is your implicit ideas, your implicit beliefs. The hard thing in teaching is to make that explicit. So you may say to a student, well, it seems to me while this client is doing such and such, you could look at it another way. But why are you looking at it another way? Are you being fueled by a theoretical idea, a value base. Um, again, for the field instructor, the importance of you making it explicit for yourself and then being able to teach that to the student, what underlies your opinions? Um, the other thing that's very important in these reflective discussions, and I think we're doing that a lot in social work, is to understand the cultural context, to understand the attitudes, the worldview, the, the assumptions from the society we live in, the communities we grew up in, the way the family interpreted those experiences and how that has become lodged and nested in our personal professional self. So to help students recognize that as well. Another very important thing about um, reflective discussion is the observation that we live in what one can call a very distracted life in very, um, oh, terrific. Thank you. That was a quick recovery. Uh, I don't know if I, I'm afraid to try and get rid of that little box. I, I think you can just click on the X. The X? Oh, the oh OK. No. Oh, OK. I can. Yeah. There. Great. And so this slide is basically about the, ta the, the idea, and there have been some people writing about it, that modern day life, we're distracted, we're pressured, everybody's rushing around. What a luxury to have a field instruction session where you can sit back and actually quietly and thoughtfully reflect on why you did what you did, what are some of the assumptions, what are some of the judgments, and that it can be a critical analysis and a critical appraisal in an intellectual way where one doesn't feel hurt, but rather you, the student and field instructor feel that they're exchanging ideas and that this becomes a model for practice in agencies and, and through the future. And my point is to use this model of competence to, for the reflection so that you aren't, as I said earlier, going to go through every single dimension of it every single time. It's interesting. I, um, I've been doing a lot of presenting in different countries where there's different dominant models. So in some places where people still use, um, are very steeped in psychodynamic models, they, they say, we spend a lot of time looking at self-awareness, but we really don't spend that much time with critical appraisal, 
critical thinking um, and judgment. In other places, people will say, we're talking a lot about evidence-based practice and research into practice, so we're talking a lot about how we think and how we make judgments, but we're leaving out the way ourselves are getting stirred up and our own how our inner our own inner feelings are affecting the judgments we make. So I think this is just a kind of nice roadmap for touching base on all dimensions. The other thing that I'm because I've become very interested in the impact of teaching skills that um, if we don't give students the most basic skills, interviewing skills, relationship joining skills, assessment skills, if we don't give them that um, body of knowledge, well, it's not about, it's a body of knowledge and it's the ability to do, then really we, we can't be talking about competence because in the last analysis, all, everything that's going on in you needs to be implemented through what you actually do. Uh, I think I've talked a bit enough about this, so I am going to just skip uh, through it. Um, but the essence of this focus on cognitions and emotions is really um, helping people make sense of their personal in the professional so that they can tease out and sort out and bring together and ultimately come to planning and intervention. And the last piece that I want to talk about is feedback. Again, social learning theory and research on learning shows the importance of feedback. Now, there, ha there are studies on feedback during an observation. And the study, there's, now there isn't a lot of literature, so this is not a definite take home message, but a very interesting study in Australia where they gave feedback during, they were teaching people new skills, this was investigative interviewing of uh, children who'd been sexually abused. And when they gave feedback during the interview, as compared to all the feedback at the end of the interview, the interviewees, the new, the students and social worker psychologists, their learning was significantly higher than when they got it all at the end. Now, you know, it's not the study to end the world, and we need more studies like that, but clearly it shows that giving feedback during an experience provides you with the ability to correct what you're doing, to practice something new and different, and to integrate it. There's a very large body of literature called transfer of learning. So people go to trainings, and then the question is, how do they, do they transfer what they learned somewhere else back into the agency? And what that literature shows is that it's better if the training is in the agency, but the training must be reinforced through peer feedback and supervisory feedback specifically targeted to what was learned and what is being mastered. So it's in other literature, it's called deliberate practice, where you were trying to teach people to deliberately and intentionally use particular approaches and skills. And all of this literature shows the importance of feedback that's as close in time as possible, so the immediacy thing, that's collaborative, so both the student and the field instructor are trying to work on together 
you know, what am I doing, what needs to be done differently, based on real data, and a balance between positive and negative. There's a lot of uh, studies that says objectionable fee feedback is feedback that is demeaning or that is too harsh. Now, feedback can also, very often, um, it seems to me that what happens in field education sessions is that the students will present you with a, um, a fairly significant problem with the case, and then they'll be brainstorming about what you should do next. This really looks at focusing the feedback a bit more broadly about the client's goals and progress, about the student's learning, their goals and their progress, and beginning to build towards this assessment of competence so that the feedback is related to students' overall performance. Out of all of this, observing, practicing, observing, reflective discussion, feedback, out of all of it, you're trying really to come up with, so what do we do next? If we think this, then what has to happen next? So there's a real conceptualization of a situation. There's collaborative brainstorming, but brainstorming that builds on what you've extracted from your discussion. And then the what we should do next might mean that you need to do some coaching, some skill training, some role playing, or some modeling. So for instance, the student may be working um, with a family where they're having trouble engaging a very quiet member in the family. You've talked about it. You understand the dynamics. You've talked about the student issues. Both of you understand that. But how do you do it? And you may say, well, come and watch me. I'm interviewing such and such a family. Watch me, but watch me in a very focused way. Watch me to see how do I engage and work with this very quiet member. And then, with any of these observation activities, it's important to debrief. <coughs> and again, to debrief in a very focused way, because time is always of the essence. But if the debrief is focused exactly on what you want the student to observe, to pay attention to, then the learning cycle is nicely pulled together. So at this point, um, I want to stop because I want to give you an opportunity to chew on and work with all of this material. Um, what I would suggest, oh, well, first, um, I think we have a few minutes. Let me just look at my schedule. A few minutes for comments. Yeah, we do have some time for comments, thoughts about all that I've presented. Okay, well, I, let's see if, uh, um, the essence of what I, I think I'm saying is, most of you are with graduate students. Yeah, although it probably holds true for, true for undergrads as well. With our graduate students, we're really, usually really good at talking about ideas. And our graduate students, especially at a good university like this, are smart. They wouldn't be here if they weren't smart and able to operate intellectually. So they, they know how to talk. They know how to, what's that expression, talk the talk, but do they know how to walk the walk? If we don't give them the skills to take great ideas like empowerment, collaboration, 
if we don't give them the skills to really put that into practice, like how do you collaborate when the client is saying to you, get out of my face? What is the skill? The skill is being able to, to empathize with why she's saying that, being able to deal with your authority that you're there for a child protection reason. So how do you put that into words? The skill, like how do you make it your words in your mouth so that you can take great ideas like empowerment and collaboration and really work with them on the ground? That, that's, the, that's the idea of it, that, um, that certainly I think in the universities we have a way to go to get to the skill level. I think in the field it's sometimes the opposite, that you have the skill because you're working in situations like this every day and it needs to be linked to these conceptual frameworks that the students are their heads are filled with the frameworks and the importance of always linking them back and forth. So, um, a very interesting <coughs> feedback. feedback, yeah. And um, we haven't gotten to it, but you alluded to the evaluation of the yeah. progress. And I think in social work, you've mentioned OT Unlike those settings in social work, we are in host settings, right? We are we, we are amongst other people who are not social workers yeah. most of the time. Yeah. And so with that, our field instructors aren't always the ones who are observing the work. Right. Because the need for task supervisors to facilitate the learning because a social worker can't do it all in a setting. So I'm stuck, <laughs> right? Like I'm stuck with this idea that it's important to observe and observe and to practice and to observe, but yet the reality of the work that we do as social workers cannot really um, facilitate that type of learning because we're one, maybe we may be the only social worker in that setting, which then limits our ability to constantly observe a student um, and then to provide them with the amount of feedback that is necessary in a nursing or in an OT or um, when you move into uh, chatting with each other, I think that's a great thing to discuss with others in terms of how you deal with it. Um, my own comment would be uh, that, that I totally agree you can't do it all the time. We don't have that model where the doctors do rounds and they're watching each other. Uh, but I do think there can be samples. And um, again, we've been doing a lot of research. We're, we're using simulations, but we're watching hours and hours and hours of students' practice. And what the we've gotten experience at watching, and it's amazing how much you can get out of a 10-minute. I can watch 10 minutes. And, and I'm doing it with other raters, so we're looking at inter-rater reliability. And in, if you're, you get experienced at it, you know what you're watching for. In 10 minutes, you get, you say, ah, that's the struggles. That's, that's what I need to focus on in the teaching. So I think in, um, in most settings where you can't do a lot of this, you can probably do samples of it, which can then really inform the other kinds of work that you're doing. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's that, you know, really, our question, like Diane would, would argue, is that everything should really be integrated. You can't separate field from the classroom. I know. They really need to be together. 
Yeah. Well, you know, now you're touching on the historical structural problem of social work education. Um, although you do raise an interesting point, and that is, you know, we're always asking students to work in groups. And how much do we ever train students how to work in groups? The best article I ever read about how to work in groups to do a class project was written by a chemistry professor at Stanford <laughs> who has students work in groups. And he takes one entire class, a three-hour class out of, I don't know, 15, 16 weeks, just to train the students how to work in groups. If anybody's interested, I think it's on their education development website. But it's the same thing of, you know, there are skills here, there's values, and you have to train people with those skills. Any other comments at this point? Yeah. Well, to piggyback off of what they're saying, because they're, you're talking about working in a multiple disciplinary yeah. setting that um, it would perhaps be helpful to um, kind of emphasize to the students how they are professional um, as much as the other professions may not look at us as such but that we should um, own the fact that we are professionals in that setting as well and um, this is where we have to maybe um, become empowered ourselves to in order to know that we can operate on that same playing field with them. Yeah. Again, you're t are you talking about health settings? Yeah. Yeah, yeah health yes. settings. Yeah. yeah. Um, because I've been doing a lot of work in health settings, and I must say I have seen things change over many years. Um, <clears throat> but it was as if we were the poor cousins that it was okay to have nursing students, uh, what do you call it, medical students, nursing students, blah, blah, blah. But social work students sort of weren't on the radar. But happily, and I think this is, reading the literature, it's happened in the U.S. as well. <clears throat> I think it's all because of money. People have discovered <clears throat> the, um, <clears throat> the benefits of interprofessional care and interprofessional education. So do you hear the word IPE? Not much. Yeah, it's a big buzzword, interprofessional education. There's journals, there's conferences, and it happens in the health field. Happens a lot also in working with the elderly. And universities are going more and more into training students in courses, but then also in the field settings. So um, I don't know the structure here well enough to know who you have to piggyback onto, but I've seen a real improvement in recognizing that social, work, social workers are really important in this interprofessional domain, and then they need to be educated in their own profession as well as in interprofessional work. I was just going to add, it feels like it's really important for social workers who are field educators in a site where it's multidisciplinary to really talk about social work identity and the pride of yes. that. I mean, yeah. I, I think there are certainly, there's not a social worker in the room who hasn't been disempowered or looked at in a way that made them question or just made them feel like maybe they weren't valued. But I think as social workers, we need to develop a value in our identity and then teach our, you know, we're in a site where there's the majority is psychologists, so there certainly was a dynamic there that yeah. we need our social work interns to realize you are very valued here, the profession. I have to say our context values the social workers who work there, so that makes, that makes it, a it little easier. Yeah. But I think if you work in a setting where maybe social work isn't as valued, you have to develop a way to believe in its value and then help your social work interns. Yeah understand that, organize it. Same thing as I'll talk to social work interns when they'll get a case. I'll say, if you're sitting there across that client thinking that client got the short stick and got stuck with you as an intern, you need to really shift that. And yeah. I've talked to them how research source supports that social work interns are very optimistic and new professionals think anything's possible, where some of us people who have been in the field a long time are a little more cynical about how much change can happen. 
So they need to really, I think mm -hmm. they need some help really embracing their value and mm -hmm. their identity as a social worker. Now, social workers have done very well in the mental health field in some of the studies that we've done um, when, when um, organizations moved to program management. You know, they did away with central social work, psychology, what have you, and everything became program management. In one study we did, half the m program managers were social workers. Of course, because they can work with teams. So they're, they're logical to have them as managers. Zoe? Yeah, and I wondered, and also this would be for anyone in, in the room, one thing that um, we hear from field educators about the idea of observing or videotaping is people raise the concern as far as confidentiality and then getting uh, clients permission for that and also just potentially the expense of <coughs> that. And I don't know if you or anyone has any thoughts about giving advice on uh, either, gee, that's not so bad once you really do it or any advice, because I think you brought up such a great point uh, it's easier to discuss something if you've had an opportunity to observe it and for all of us to observe our own behavior. But I think that that's just a big barrier. And so I didn't know if you had any thoughts on how to help people overcome that or if anyone else who's doing that might have thoughts. Let's hear from the group first. Our interns are required to tape every session. See, end of we're story. We're fortunate that we're in a context where they invested in the cost of yeah. getting the webcams and all the interview rooms. So we, again, this is sort of the advantage of being in a site that also has a lot of psychology trainees. Yeah. So that's a part of their, what that's they right. do. So social work said yes to, and so. And I think it's Exactly, it's just done. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so it's interesting. Done. I remember when, years ago when we started this with, in, in our program,